Now, it seems to me, maybe it seems to you, that we live in a world that has been really divided recently, right? Black, white, right, left, conservative, liberal, Republican, Democrat, man, woman, winners, and losers. And sometimes I, I look around this world and, and I listen to the news and I listen and watch the tweets and everything else that goes on. And, and, I, and I say, have we always been this divided? North, south, old, young, urban, rural? Now Mark Twain, before he became the literary giant that wrote Huckleberry Finn and, and the adventures of Tom Sawyer, well, he led a, a rather interesting life before settling down in Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, Mark Twain, uh, his real name was Samuel Clemens, uh, grew up in Missouri and spent many nights as a child on his uncle's farm uh, working and, and just playing with the slaves that were there. He learned a lot about um, that kind of culture. When he was 11 years old, though, his father died and Samuel went to be an apprentice to work in a newspaper. And then when he turned 18, he moved to New York and then Philadelphia, and he worked with newspapers. And then four years, he worked as a riverboat pilot on the Mississippi River until the Confederate uh, Civil War uh, interrupted and he joined the Confederacy. And he lasted all of two weeks in the Confederacy. And then he left, and his brother was the new uh, secretary for the Nevada Territory out in Nevada. And so he went down there to, to kind of help his brother out. And then he became, again, an editor of a small little paper out there. Samuel Clemens uh, then moved uh, to San Francisco and Sacramento. And, and when he was in Sacramento, he became a travel writer. And they sent him to Hawaii. And he got to talk about what it was like to be in Hawaii. And, and they sent him to Europe. And they sent him to, do, to Jerusalem. And, and he wrote several books out of that. One was called Roughing It. The other one is called The Innocents Abroad. And, and I don't know if you've ever read any of those Mark Twain writings that were not Huckleberry Finn or Adventures of Tom Sawyer. But what's so cool about reading this 19th century idea of, of what a travel log is, uh, he really paints a great picture of the world around him. What is evident is that even though there's 150 years separating those experiences from us now, well, you discover that people are no different now than they were then. Technology certainly has changed, our, our language has changed, how we dress has changed. But what makes us human beings, our laughter, our pain, our scandal, our sin, our joy, and our love for one another remains the same? Well, I found some quotes from Mark Twain that he had about politics and life that I think ring true now, just as they did then. He said, he wrote at one point, and this is 1907, the political and commercial morals of the United States are not merely food for laughter. They are an entire banquet. An honest man in politics shines more there than he would elsewhere. Politicians in diapers must be changed often, and for the same reason. <laughs> Never argue with... <laughs> yeah, it's one of my favorite. Never argue with a fool. Onlookers might know, not know the difference. Never try to teach a pig to sing. You'll waste your time and you'll annoy the pig. <laughs> and finally, age is an issue of mind over matter. If you don't mind, it don't matter. <laughs> if his words still ring true today, maybe it's good for us to even look further back and maybe think of some other words that are good for us to hear. And so we hear from Paul and we hear from Jesus today in our New Testament lessons. And while it's probably not healthy for me as a pastor to like pick and choose from one gospel and go to Romans and go back to the gospel, I kind of did that today because I really felt that my sermon would fit well with what's going on in our world today and looking at these two teachings from Jesus and Paul. So what we hear in Matthew chapter 11 is that Jesus is talking to the crowds about John the Baptist. At this point in the gospel, John the Baptist is in prison. And he hears what Jesus is doing, and some of his followers come to Jesus and say to Jesus, now, now are you really the Messiah? And Jesus responds to them by saying, well, well, go tell John that the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. Jesus then lifts up all that John had done in his prophet, prophecy ministry. 
uh, in his role as a hair shirt wearing, locust eating wild man living in the desert. We know that John's in prison because he spoke the truth about King Herod. He, he said to the guy, you know, you're sleeping with your brother's wife, you're being an adulterer. And as we hear later in the gospel story, John is executed just on the whim of that same king because of his lust for his stepdaughter. When we pick up the narrative in Matthew 11, Jesus is explaining how fickle his current generation is. And he goes and he says that the, the crowds go here, John the Baptist, and they find his conservative, repent or going to hell message a little too difficult to hear. John the Baptist tells people they need to get out of their comfort zones, that they just can't get stuck on the belief that they're already good enough, but that they have to uh, understand that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then Jesus comes, and Jesus' approach is a little bit different. He doesn't just hang out with the rich and the powerful and the influential. Instead, Jesus hangs out with the outcast, the sinner, the prostitutes, the poor, the tax collectors. In some ways, if John the Baptist is a conservative hellfire and damnation preacher, Jesus is a more inclusive liberal guy saying, come and everybody who needs to come and, and find God. Maybe it's a come as you are message. Come to church, wear your shorts, wear your jeans. Come and hear a message of grace. I never picked this up before, but in this moment of time, in this one chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, we have the way that God reaches out to all kinds of people together there in just a few verses. You, you have the, the hellfire damnation preacher and John the Baptist, and you have the let's go reach out to the poor and the outcast and tell them that there is radical grace for them on the other side. It's as if God knew that we needed both John the Baptist and Jesus to understand the totality of God's grace. Well, Jesus describes his generation as, as like not liking either side. They, you know, either Jesus is too much of a, a drunkard and hanging out with sinners, or John the Baptist is too strict. And, and he says that our generation is like a group of children who are, approach adults, and, and when they sing, they want us to be happy, and when they wail, they want us to be sad, and yet we don't respond with the right emotions. You know, you know what I'm talking about. How many of you have been around a three-year-old? And they come up to you, and they say, watch me. And, and then they do something funny. What do they expect you to do? Laugh. Expect you to laugh. What if that three-year-old came up to you crying and sad, and they came up, what would they expect from you? Uh, Hugs and comfort. And they want you to be sad for them too, right? And yet what happens is what Jesus is recognizing is that the crowds, instead of responding to the right emotions that those kids are bringing, they're ignoring it, or they're making it something totally different. You know, they look at Jesus, and instead of seeing the compassion of his grace, they see him being somebody who's sinful. And, and, and when they look at John the Baptist, who is offering repentance, they see somebody who's full of a demon. You know, I think some of this kind of happens in our world today, too. Did anybody hear about what happened on July 4th? So NPR decided to tweet out the Declaration of Independence line by line. Y'all heard about that? Well, somebody took offense about, actually a lot of people took offense when there was a line about tyrants and how we need to overthrow tyrants and somebody assumed that was about Trump. <laughs> and it wasn't. But the comments that you see on the Twitter page just went on and on and on and on, and Facebook comments on and on and on and on. And it made me realize that, that we are on a hair trigger, aren't we? We are, have been conditioned over the last six months or a year to respond to anything ever said and think that it's offensive to us, right? And it's not just on the conservative side, it's on the liberal side too. You know, you say certain words and all of a sudden you're going to get this Pavlovian response of, it's the end of the world, or everything is going to die, or there's nuclear apocalypse happening, right? How many of you have family like that? You can't say, you say one word and all of a sudden you're stuck in this hellhole, right? <laughs> Sorry. 
You see, I think right now in our world, all of us are like people walking around with a loaded gun in our hand and our hand on the trigger. We're just waiting to fire. And there's no ready aim and fire. It's ready, fire, aim, isn't it? And we don't care who gets hit or who the collateral damage is. It's like we're just ready to overreact to anything. And maybe we're like those adults in Jesus' time, ignoring the children's calls to laugh and dance when it's time to laugh and to weep when it's time to weep. What I love about this chapter, Matthew chapter 11, is that we see how different John the Baptist and Jesus approach telling about the story of God. On one hand, we have John the Baptist, the traditional prophet, calling on us to change our sinful lives. And John speaks directly, and he speaks to us. His audience are those who are already in church, who are already living a life that they think is holy. He's trying to remind us that, hey, you know, we are in still need of God's grace every moment. And then Jesus reminds us that we need to reach out to those who don't find welcome in the church for those who are the sinners, for those that we've already rejected in our world. He's there for the ones who have already given up, who believe that they're not worth anything. And if we look at the stories of Jesus, we are reminded of that over and over again. Remember the woman who came into that dinner with all the Pharisees, Jesus was there with the Pharisees, and this woman comes bursting into the room. She opens up a very expensive bottle of perfume and washes his feet with her hair. Or what about the woman who was caught in the midst of adultery and she's dragged out in the street ready to be stoned and Jesus stands up for her and says, he who is without sin cast the first stone. Or what about the thief who acknowledges on the cross that yes, I deserve to die, but this man is still innocent and he asks for Jesus' blessings that he may get into heaven. That's who Jesus is reaching in our gospel. And so we hear both. We hear John the Baptist. We hear Jesus. And we understand that the, the grace that is offered is not only for the outcast and the sinner. It's also offered for us who believe that we're doing what is right. And that's where I'd like to turn to our passage of Romans. And I'd like to look at Paul. You see, Paul really ends up being like the extra disciple, doesn't he? You kind of you kind of figure out that in the, in the beginning of Acts that you know well, Judas is gone and they have the eleven disciples and they're all in Jerusalem starting their own little church, but it, but it seems as, as if Jesus in, in his resurrection said you know I, I think we need somebody to talk to the Gentiles too and so Paul is called on that road to Damascus, he's blinded by a light, he's offered this gift of, of being able to speak to the Roman Empire to speak to those who would not were not initially welcomed into the church. But Paul is a funny type of guy. He's very intelligent. We read in Romans this, this great theology of the church and of what we're supposed to believe about grace. But in this chapter, chapter 7, we see Paul recognizing that he is as human as the rest of us. Now, Paul doesn't have the same sense of humor Mark Twain did. I think it would be a whole different type of letters if Paul wrote like Mark Twain, right? But Paul has the same sort of wisdom. For in Paul's confession about wanting to do right but still doing wrong, we see the truth in ourselves, don't we? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, Paul writes elsewhere in his letters. And in Romans chapter 7, Paul tells us, For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? In these few verses, all of us can relate to Paul. Right? Can you relate to that? How many of you wanted to do the right thing and you do the wrong thing? How many of you have been in an argument with a spouse or a loved one and you said the wrong thing and you really meant to say the right thing? Right? How many of you in your parenting have done the wrong thing? I am going to feed you more. <laughs> and you do the wrong thing, right? And then Paul says, thanks to be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
You see, it's, it's important that we have the message of John the Baptist reminding us that, that we are always in need of repentance and forgiveness. And it's great to have the grace of Jesus reminding us that we need to welcome those who we consider outcasts in our world because it reminds us that all of us are together in this world. And finally, we need Paul. That even though he was uh, you know, this great missionary and great founder of a church and a great preacher, that he even acknowledges himself, the wrestling that goes on in a Christian's life. How we wrestle against sin even when we've been saved. You see, we need to cry out to God with the words Paul uses. Wretched man that I am, or if you're not a man, wretched woman that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? This is where I like to turn back to the last half of our scripture from the Gospel of Matthew. You see, Jesus offers a prayer for us all. He says, Thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. And I don't know if you picked it up last week, but when we read the Gospel of Matthew, he calls us uh, innocents. He calls us babes. And, and he's talking about us. None of us are wise. None of us are intelligent. We are all infants in faith. We are all the little ones. We are fickle. We are imperfect. We go to our sides and our corners and we fight over religion, politics, money, and all kinds of other things. A couple of words will set us off. And yet, we are given the gift of love and grace even in our ignorance. And Jesus finishes up what we hear today in our gospel, reminding us that we can come to him. He says, come to me, all that you are weary and all are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Maybe your burden is found in your relationship with friends and family. Maybe your burden is a personal struggle with addiction. Maybe some of you wrestle with depression or mental illness. Maybe you find yourself in need of forgiveness because you carry around a lot of guilt. Maybe your burden cannot be described right here and right now in any of my words. But take comfort, take comfort that there is nothing new under the sun. We heard from Mark Twain, even 150 years ago, the politics of our nation were crazy. He once described the Nevada legislature as, a, as an asylum. I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> all that we're feeling, all that we are experiencing in all the world, all of our struggles, God has seen it all. And God knows that we need help. So I encourage you to pray. I encourage you to ask for forgiveness and to seek God's help. May God take your burdens and may you find peace. Amen. Amen.